If you're running, still isn't getting any faster, you're probably caught in a hidden trap most runners don't even know about. In fact, there are five of these traps you really need to avoid if you're serious about running faster, including one that's ridiculously simple to fix. But before we get to that, tell me if Steve's story sounds familiar to you. Steve's been working hard over the last year or so in an effort to improve his 5k time. He's managed to drop his personal best from 28 to just over 22 minutes. Various pace calculators suggest that with his 22 minute 8 second 5k time, he should be able to comfortably run a 1.45 half marathon. But when it came down to it, Steve ran 2.02 for his first half marathon, leaving him frustrated. I mean, it's a solid time, but Steve felt it really didn't do his 5k fitness any justice. I'm certain he's not the only one to know how this feels. The problem is that while Steve had trained himself to get good at pushing himself for 5k, and frankly gotten really good at suffering, he'd neglected building the most important part of his running fitness. Steve had been running two to three times per week and pushing hard each time, and in the context of 5k training, his all-in approach certainly yielded some initial results. But training this way didn't allow him to develop the base of aerobic fitness and endurance needed to be able to maintain the pace he wanted to run for the 13.1 mile half marathon distance. Steve didn't have the stamina to maintain the pace needed for his 145 goal and began to fade towards the 10k mark of his run. What do you think had been missing in his training? Steve would have been better served by maintaining one hard session in the week and then running one to two easy paced runs where he was barely out of breath, allowing him to train his aerobic system and build the easy miles in his legs. Now, there's a lot of truth in saying that you need to run slow to run faster. But I do have one big issue with that whole mentality and a strategy that might just be the breakthrough your running really needs. We'll get to that later. But first, let's talk about your training plan. Last year, I asked my subscribers, do you follow a specific training plan or like to keep your training a little more loose? What do you think the results look like? Nearly 80% of the 5,500 runners who responded indicated that they prefer to keep a flexible, loose approach to their training. And believe me, with two young kids at home, I totally get the practicality of winging it with your training plan, but we have to accept that consistency of training is the key to becoming a faster runner. That, and the gradual intentional progression that comes with a structured training plan. Without a plan, you're more likely to find yourself stuck at your current fitness level and running at the same pace. Okay, so a few moments ago, I mentioned a pretty huge issue I have with the advice we all hear, suggesting that all you need to do is to slow your training pace in order to run faster on race day. Before we talk about breaking through frustrating plateaus, let me explain what I really meant by that. I'm all for taking the time to build your endurance base with lots of easy paced, low heart rate, slow running. But if all you ever do is run slow, simply put, your body isn't going to remember how to run fast when you really need to push the pace. You're going to have built the endurance engine capable of running a faster, let's say 10k. But without practicing the mechanics of actually running faster in your training, it's like having a car with a tuned engine but flat tires. Your performance is about more than just building your aerobic endurance. You also need to train your muscles and nervous system to have the capacity to maintain the leg speed, stride length and power. You need to run faster for longer. That's where regular sets of strides, hill sessions, tempo runs and interval workouts really come into their own. Particularly as you get to within a few months of a target race. Don't worry about them too much if you're in a phase where you're just building easy mileage, but as you get into a phase where you've done your base training and you're now training for a specific event, just adding one such speed workout per week will make all the difference. Less is more with these intense sessions. Don't be tempted to overdo it. Just know that turning up on race day expecting to run fast, if you haven't run fast in training is never a smart move. Sometimes though, it really does feel like your training has hit a brick wall and no matter what you try, you just can't seem to make progress. If that sounds familiar, it sounds like you've hit a plateau in your training. It happens to the best of us. Experiencing a plateau can be frustrating as it's a period where improvement seems just out of reach. It's a sign that your body has adapted to your current routine and needs a new challenge. 
But there is a simple fix to this annoying problem. It often takes more than simply adding a speed workout each week where you hadn't been doing one previously, or bumping up your weekly mileage. In fact, the more is better mindset is often a fast track to injury, pain and frustration. Instead, consider the plateau as your body trying to tell you it's ready for a change of stimulus and direction. Here's an example. If you've run a few marathons in the last couple of years and have been training for long distance fairly exclusively, you might well find that 12 to 16 weeks focused on training for a 5k race is exactly what your body needed to break through the funk and run better than ever when you go back to the longer stuff. While we're talking about shaking things up to take your running to the next level, it would be stupid to ignore your running form particularly what happens to your running stride mechanics when fatigue kicks in on a long or hard run. Okay, back to running form. There's one huge running mistake which so many runners make when they get tired, and avoiding it might just save you from the pain and frustration of injuries like runners' knee and calf strains, and in cases like Christoph here, Achilles tendon problems. Christoph is actually one of my Bulletproof Runners members who sent me this footage of his easy-paced running technique. Here he's about 13k, 8-ish miles, into a long run. Let's start by looking where his foot strikes the ground, relative to the rest of his body. You can see that he's landing heel first. The heel strike in itself I have no issue with, I'm way more concerned with where that initial point of contact occurs, relative to his knee and the rest of his body above. The easiest rule of thumb to tell whether somebody is overstriding is to look at the shin angle at the point of initial contact. If the lower leg is angled such that the ankle is ahead of the knee as the foot hits the ground, that's an overstride. Ideally, regardless of how the foot strikes the ground, heel, midfoot or forefoot, I'd want to see a vertical shin with the ankle under a flexing knee at the point of initial contact, allowing muscles around the knee, ankle and hip to act as the natural shock absorbers they really should be in this phase of your running stride. In the context of Christoph's Achilles, this overstride means that his contact time will be a little longer than it should be. I roughly calculated his cadence to be in the mid-170s from this footage, which is pretty reasonable at this easy pace. An increased ground contact time puts strain through the Achilles tendon for longer than necessary during each stride. But that's not the main issue overloading his Achilles. We'll get to that. I don't think his running cadence is the issue here. We need to take a closer look at why his body is opting to reach ahead with the lower leg during each stride. We need to appreciate that how and where the foot lands is also a consequence of how the hips move and the stride angle that's created. By the way, if you'd like me to break down your running form in a video here on the channel, there's a form linked down in the description you can use to submit your running footage. Stride angle is effectively the separation between leading and trailing legs at the hip, at the point where the trailing foot leaves the ground, known as toe-off. Perfect stride angle is obviously relative to pace, but there is one tried and true rule of thumb you can use to assess how well a runner is driving from the hips with an appropriate stride angle versus running without making full use of those powerful, important hip muscles and therefore having to compensate elsewhere. Let me show you. It's super simple. At toe off, if you freeze frame and draw a line from hip to ankle on the rear leg, the shin of the leading leg should be approximately parallel to that first line. This simple test holds true for most running paces slower than a sprint. Sprinting mechanics follow a lot of the same fundamentals, but with a handful of key differences. Perhaps that's a topic for another breakdown video like this one. In a distance runner like Christoph here, running at a steady state, if you see that we don't have those parallel lines, you can see that the lower leg is already extending out to land ahead of the knee with an overstride. The way to fix this is to work on subtly improving the knee lift, getting a little more hip flexion into each stride to increase the stride angle. That way, the ground coverage will come from the increased separation at the hips rather than the lower leg having to reach out to gather up the ground ahead. This all needs to happen with a decent degree of core control, but I know Christoph's working on this with the Bulletproof Runners program. The beauty of working to increase the active hip flexion or knee lift is that if helps to trigger the crossed extensor reflex which will actually encourage Christoph to use his glutes more through the mid to back end of his stance phase, pushing off using those bigger, more powerful muscles. Whereas right now, I feel he's not using his glutes as effectively and placing more demand on his calf and Achilles complex to push off through his ankles, overloading his Achilles tendon. 
Obviously, I haven't had the chance to properly assess Kristoff in person. These are just observations based on a video and my two decades of experience as a sports rehab therapist and running coach. But hopefully this kind of analysis is helpful. Let me know if you want to see more breakdowns like this one in future videos.